This is a really simple song, and it's one that you could bring back into your own church context. It's simple in melody and simple in words, but it's profound in its meaning. Um, so as we begin our work again today, I invite you to, um, to sing along or listen along, um, do whatever you feel led to do this morning as we begin this day in worship. And we pray that God would teach us God's ways and that we would be able to learn from one another and learn to love each other in new and surprising ways. Teach us your ways. Teach us your ways as we learn from one another. Learn to love each other. Teach us your ways. Katie, thank you so much for leading us in worship. What a beautiful song and a good reminder um, of what we're doing together and how we're learning together. I'm Lindsay Whelan Capel, Director of Disability Concerns for the Christian Reformed Church in North America. I am a tall white woman with shoulder length brown hair and bluish green eyes, and I'm sitting in my office at the Christian Reformed Church in North America. And if you could see the building, it's a very large building. I am the only person on the entire half of this building. <laughs> Nobody comes in on Friday. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. We are so glad to have you here with us. And I know um, six hours is a lot of time over two days. And uh, this is uh, no small thing to commit to. So we are grateful you're here. So we want to introduce our interpreters, Corinne Grappuso and Tegan Smart-Blake. And they are on the screen taking turns for the whole event. Um, and there are descriptions of our interpreters on our website for the event, if you'd like to know more about them. I also want to acknowledge um, that we have uh, a staff and a team of people who have worked very hard to um, plan this event. So if you were one of the people who helped plan today and yesterday, if you would just wave on your screen or, or unmute and say hello, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you, everybody who helped make today happen. And also, um, you know, our, our Disability Concerns team, uh, Terry DeYoung, Becky Jones, 
And Erica, now yesterday you messed up her name and now I'm blanking here. What is my problem? Erica Fleming, thank you. Uh, sorry, Erica, we're struggling today. Um, we all have known Erica a long time when she had a different name. And so it's in the in our heads wrong. Um, sorry, Erica. Um, so Becky and Erica have been doing so much behind the scenes. It really is blowing me away. They are managing a thousand details and a thousand questions. So I just want to specifically name them and thank them for the long hours and tons of work that they have put into making this event a success. And now I have the opportunity to introduce the wonderful Jenna Hoff. Um, she has a recorded pre-recorded video of devotions that she shared with us at an advisory committee guiding coalition meeting. And we said, oh, would you please uh, record that so we can share it at our training? And she has graciously done that. So Jenna is one of the wonderful people that helped us plan this event as well. So um, I will be reading Jenna's visual description as she wrote it. Uh, Jenna is a Caucasian woman with blue eyes and straight brown hair that goes just below her shoulders. She is of unknown age. She intermittently remembers to wear her glasses. Other times they are perched precariously on top of her head. She uses a white AAC communication device. Recently, I've been contemplating the Beatitudes of Matthew 5, 1-12 to that were taught by Jesus during his Sermon on the Mount. Frankly, I've never been a big fan of the Beatitudes. I mistakenly thought they conjured an image of a miserable, dour, joyless, mournful life marked by timidity, a person poor in both spirit and personality. This dour image is exactly the opposite of the joy, verve, and creativity I try embrace in my own life. However, as I looked at the Beatitudes in a new light this week, I was struck both by their beauty and by how significantly they dovetail with the mission and pursuit of ending or reducing ableism in our churches. Let's begin by reading the Beatitudes. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Reading commentaries on the Beatitudes to try and understand them more deeply, I came to see that they are not instructing us to live dour, miserable, joyless, mournful lives of timidity. My desire to live with joy is not counter to them. Instead, at the heart of the Beatitudes is a spirit of humility and a right approach to our Father and to our Father's calling to love our neighbor in this suffering world. At the heart is a spirit of seeing ourselves as we really are, including our struggles, and bringing them before God. A quietness, 
confidence, and strength that aligns with our Christian calling to love God and our neighbors with all we are, as lived out through lives of love, justice, mercy, and walking humbly with our God. And it is this humble spirit of love, justice, and mercy that should be at the center of our approach to ending ableism in our churches. It is an understanding that a quiet and humble spirit does not just mean welcoming people with disabilities and creating spaces for them but allowing them to welcome and create spaces for you. To see people with disabilities as equals as you serve beside them or as you serve under their leadership. How counter this is to our society, in which the powerful are expected to be the leaders, the ones who reach down to save or help the less powerful. Our society usually values and grants certain people more power, those who are bigger, richer, stronger, younger, smarter, faster, more beautiful or are of certain ethnicities may be seen as better and allocated more power. This is obviously wrong. We also see this when people of typical ability are more highly valued and given power far beyond people with disabilities. This exclusion and devaluing of people with disabilities is the very heart of ableism. And it is just as prevalent in our churches as elsewhere, which is why the work of combating ableism is so important. Often the devaluing takes the form of able saviorism, with which at the heart is a premise that the powerful reach down and help the powerless. This can be expressed as typically abled or neurotypical saviors who come in to fix things for people with disabilities. Who doesn't want to be the hero who helps the disadvantaged person, running in quickly and loudly to fix things? That feels good. People look up to you when you are the helpful person. But this approach goes against the very soul of Jesus' Beatitudes. When we embrace a Beatitudinal spirit, we enter with quiet humility, fighting against those power structures that make some people the normal ones and some the disabled. This is why it is critical that we serve include, and advocate alongside people with and without disabilities to fight ableism in our churches. That we surrender to those with lived experiences with ableism to be the leaders in teaching us instead of us taking charge. That we listen to their voices instead of clamoring over theirs. That we see and embrace each person for who they are, instead of mentally categorizing ourselves into an us and them. It may make us less of the heroes. But it is the way Jesus teaches us to live. And please don't think for one moment that I am immune to having an ableist heart just because I have physical disabilities and experience ableism against myself on a fairly frequent basis. I mean, to look at me or speak with me is to know I'm different and the world reminds me of my differences constantly. I could tell you stories of my own experiences with ableism that would curl your toes. But, somehow, my own experience and awareness haven't seemed to prevent me from having an ableist approach to others who live with disabilities different than my own. Being disabled myself doesn't automatically make my heart humble, my approach meek and serving, my love soft and genuine. I need a beatitudinal spirit as much as anyone. God has really been making me aware of this able s sin in my own life including with my own adult son who lives with disabilities. Sometimes, I find myself at my wits and when he displays behaviors I find challenging. As a mother, I grieve when I see choice after choice made that hurts both himself and others. 
But I feel God challenging me to realize that my frustration is unfair and in fact is rooted in ableism. I've never lived with cognitive disabilities or the extreme trauma experienced by my kids before their adoptions into my family, experiences that deeply marked and shaped them. And yet, despite our significant differences in experience and level of ability, Somehow, I expect my son to behave and think like me and make the choices I think he should make. And I get so surprised and mad when he doesn't, when he cannot display behaviors that characterize a person of typical cognitive ability who has not experienced severe trauma. This is ableism at its worst, and my ableism doesn't help him. Instead, my beatitudinal goal is to listen, value, and let him lead and write the story of his own life. For him to be my teacher even while I and his team provide him the caregiving life support he needs. To approach him with an attitude of love, mercy, humility, and peace. To welcome God in writing out the story of the beatitudes in my life and in my sons and my relationship. And, likewise, this is what we are called to do in our work and roles within disability concerns. To fight to end ableism in churches by embracing our beatitudinal calling. To be quiet in spirit, mild, gentle, listening to our God and following his lead. To grieve with those who face ableism both inside and outside our churches. To remember we are not the saviors of people with disabilities, but we walk or wheel alongside of them. To have pure hearts of love, listening, and support as we work alongside people with disabilities and follow their leadership as we stand or sit together. And to be merciful peacemakers, doing all we can to live and share lives of peace and mercy. This is our Beatitudinal Calling. Thank you so much, Jenna. We appreciate your vulnerability in sharing with us. It's, it's a good reminder. Now I have the opportunity to introduce our main speakers for today. Our theme today is how can churches overcome ableism? Just a reminder, this is Lindsay speaking. Today's discussion will be led by Reverend Melinda Baber and Deaconess Lynn Swedberg. Reverend Melinda Baber has served as an ordained elder in the Mountain Sky Conference since 2001 and is currently the senior pastor of Phillips United Methodist Church in Lakewood, Colorado. She holds an MDiv and an MA in pastoral and spiritual care with an emphasis on trauma-informed disability justice from ILIF School of Theology. She has been a successful church planter, is a certified Benedictine spiritual director and has served in parish ministry and in law enforcement and hospice chaplaincy for over two decades. She was diagnosed as autistic in 1993 and is the fortunate, grateful mother of four adult children, three of whom are also disabled and neurodivergent. She has been a member of the Disability Ministries Committee of the United Methodist Church since April 2021 and a member of the MSC Disability Committee since July 2012. Deaconess Lynn Swedberg is an occupational therapist who has been part of the Disability Ministries Committee of the United Methodist Church since 2003, currently as disability consultant and newsletter editor. Her passion is improving accessibility to ensure that people with disabilities are fully and safety in safely included in our faith communities and ministries. Identifying as a disability ally, she wrote the Understanding Ableism article and the handouts in the Ableism Toolkit with input from voices of DMC members with disabilities. 
She is currently writing a chapter on safe sanctuaries for people with disabilities on behalf of the DMC. She co-developed the UMC Accessibility Audit and wrote the Leader's Guide for the Study on the Church and People with Disabilities. Lynn serves as an adjunct faculty in the Online Accessibility Studies Program at Central Washington University and makes her home in Spokane, Washington. Thank you, Melinda and Lynn, for joining us today for our keynote, and I'll pass it to you now. Good morning, everyone. This is Melinda Baber speaking. I am delighted to be invited to this presentation today and really appreciate everything that everyone else is bringing to our um, discussions and um, our learning together. Um, I am a biracial 55-year-old cisgendered woman with curly shoulder length hair brown, uh, green eyes, and rainbow-colored glasses. I'm not wearing any jewelry or any makeup. I'm the daughter of an immigrant, and I'm sitting in the basement of a fellow clergy person's home because um, my daughter, my oldest daughter, just got out of the hospital, and I am in between uh, staying with her and uh, staying with friends while I transition her uh, further along into her recovery. I'll turn it over and invite Lynn to introduce. Hi, I'm a tall Northern European woman in my late 60s with shoulder length, almost brown hair. It's starting to show some gray. Wear glasses and have a pink lace t-shirt on and my Deaconess medallion. And I'm sitting in my office with the boring background of two windows so that you don't see the clutter that's below that. So um, we bring our own context, our own struggles to this space. And I'm here representing those of us who do not have apparent, current, um, non-temporary disabilities because that's like racism work with ableism work. It's not up to people with disabilities to instruct those of us who don't currently have disabilities, we need to do our own work. And so what we're gonna be talking about today is a lot of doing our own work, um, practicing new skills. So I also wanted to share a little bit about my ableism story. I guess I come from a background as an occupational therapist. And if you've learned much about the disability world, there is a medical model which looks at people as ways to fix and ways to normalize impairment. And occupational therapy doesn't have to be that way, but it often is. And so I've had to, we talked yesterday about unlearning. I've had a lot of unlearning in the disabilities ministry theology space of some of my medical model habits and I'm working really hard to teach other occupational therapists the whole picture. Um, an ableism example for me was early on when I was just getting involved with the disability committee and going out to eat with people that included a large black man using his cane for orientation and mobility, a tall man with cerebral palsy who walked and talked with a very distinct gait and speech pattern, um, several people that were wheelchair users, a woman who had her daughter, a small adult woman with intellectual disabilities who behaved in non-typical ways. So the group of us walking into restaurants was certainly surveyed by everyone else and stared at. And I felt really uncomfortable. Those of you who live with this have been stared at your whole life and it's kind of a normal experience. For me, it was not. And I you know, confess that it was not something I really enjoyed starting later on. These are my friends. I ignore the stairs too, but I can just still remember that feeling. So, Melinda. Thank you, Lynn, for, for that um, vulnerability. I too have stories of um, my own experiences with what I call internalized ableism and um, my journey uh, in dismantling ableism is uh, has been lifelong and it will probably continue until I get to the other side. 
Um, when I was um, a young child, I was uh, first exposed to television by watching Sesame Street um, when I was uh, six. And I remember um, at the time on Sesame Street, they were teaching um, uh, young kids about categories and differences. And there was a song that played and it was it went um one of these things is not like the others one of these things just doesn't belong can you tell which one is not like the others before we finish our song and i internalized that message because i was very different from most other kids i knew and the the ablest message that because i was different i didn't belong is something that I have encountered um, from individuals and from the culture here in the United States, and in particular from the church culture. Um, I don't belong, I was told in a regular classroom, I didn't belong in ministry, in leadership, I didn't belong in public spaces. And um, to their credit, Sesame Street has changed that song. They now sing it. Um, one of these things is not like the others. One of these things just isn't the same. One of these things is not like the others. Can you tell which one before we finish our game? Mm -hmm. Which is a very different message. And so I uh, have um, spent my life um, working, my adult life in ministry, working to celebrate the fact that, that God calls all of us to belong to each other and we all belong in the church. And so um, I continue to uh, celebrate that fact and um, invite um, you to learn along with me today about ableism and how to change churches, change the culture in which we live so that everyone knows they belong. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of set the tone today, as we were looking at our challenge of how do we talk about anti-ableism and what ableism is not. Once you are aware of ableism, you're going to see it everywhere. And those of you who live with it do see it everywhere. How do you see non-ableism? That's a little bit trickier. And I thought it was interesting that Hebrews has been in the lectionary this week and kind of jumped out at me that faith is a reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. You know, we, we hope for a church, for a world that does not have ableism. And then just in today's, I added this piece, Melinda, uh, they, through faith, they brought about justice and some other things, but you know, it's definitely justice work that we're doing. And the image here is a small candle holder that says, let your light shine, Matthew 5, 16, against a, a green background. And we're just gonna kind of use that image as a placeholder on our um, section headings. So. This is Melinda speaking again. So we wanted to begin our talk with um, things that individuals can do right now to dismantle ableism in your own faith community and in your own faith life. Uh, so the first thing, is to start with yourself. Since um, we're the only people we can change <laughs> by God's grace. And we start with examining um, my own assumptions and attitudes. Um, I so appreciate Jenna's devotion this morning and, and the way she shared that her children are her teachers. Um, my children are also um, my teachers and um, God uses them to teach me about assumptions and attitudes that I have held. And, and um, what another way that you can um, begin to examine yourself as a spiritual practice and what, what assumptions you might bring is to take uh, what we call an able privilege survey. It's um, one of the tool, tools in the ableism toolkit that, um, that Lynn will be talking about more in her presentation. But um, my part is to um, take a look at, at uh, advantages that uh, some people have and some people don't have. And just 
as Jenna shared, as someone uh, uh, I identify as someone who's disabled, but I also have ableism that I'm trying to uh, acknowledge and dismantle in my own work. And so imagine if you were going to attend a faith, um, a faith group for the first time, a Bible study or um, a church, and um, you want to ask yourself if these assumptions are true for you. Um, if any of these uh, ring true, then that's, that's a place to begin. Um, if you arrive in a new facility or a new church building or a new Sunday school class, a new Bible study, um, did you need to, to have the detailed information about that facility or that gathering uh, before you showed up? And if you did um, uh, learn about that or read about that uh, church or that happening or that event, when you arrived, did it matter that things might not have matched up with what you were told or what you read about. The second thing to ask yourself um, is if you were going to uh, attend a church service or be a part of a, a Bible study, is it easy for you to get to the church any time of the day, any day of the week? And can you use your usual means of transportation to get there? A third question you could ask yourself is, if you are driving to this new church, uh, do you have to think about how easy it's going to be to find a parking place that's wide enough for you to get out of your vehicle? Do you have to think about whether there's a sidewalk that leads all the way from your vehicle to the front entrance or wherever the entrance might be? Do you have to think about cracks in the sidewalk or pebbles in your way or uneven ground in order to get there? Do you have to think about um, how long it's going to take you or where you might sit as a fourth thing? Uh, do you assume when you show up that you will be able to sit anywhere you like with your friends or family or in the front or the back or in the middle? A fifth Thing you could ask as a part of this check your ableist privilege or your advantage in being able-bodied is can you count on easily getting out of the room or the building in case of emergency? Or do you not even have to think about that when you show up? A sixth thing is uh, to ask yourself when you go to a new worship service, can you count on understanding the speakers from anywhere in the room? And can you follow along in the entire service of worship if they're only using spoken words or if they project things on a giant screen? A seventh thing to, to think about when you're attending church is what kind of um, medium, what medium is the information shared in, right? Can you easily access whatever their bulletin is, or whatever their handouts are? Is it in a format that you can use? Is the print big enough or is the sound uh, loud enough or quiet enough for you to participate? When you show up in this new place, and perhaps you don't know anybody there, can you um, anticipate not being approached and touched and have people either put you on a pedestal and tell you how brave you are or infantilize you and tell you how adorable you are? Do parishioners approach you and offer unsolicited medical advice or ask you what's wrong with you or what happened to you? Do they offer to pray for you without asking first? Number nine, when you meet people in this new church, this new Bible study, can you count on them to be 
uh, at ease in your presence or do they typically act awkward or stare at you? And then lastly, number 10, um, if you were to uh, join this church, if you're going to a new faith community, do you have the expectation that you will be asked to use your gifts to serve in leadership positions? Well, those are just 10 ways we can begin to examine our own assumptions and our own advantages if we're moving through the world um, and begin to learn uh, what it is to think differently about um, people with disabilities who don't move in those neurotypical um, uh, uh, environments. Another thing that we can do in, if we're engaging in self-reflection is to examine uh, your own insights and keep a record of them. If you're an introvert like me, um, perhaps journaling or recording uh, your own experiences might help with reflecting on, on the assumptions and attitudes that you bring to other people or um, your faith communities. Another thing I have found is um, that what I thought was a need in terms of being able to worship was actually just a preference. And as I, I have um, uh, I encouraged my children to um, develop their own faith lives, I have learned to appreciate the ways that they worship, not just the ways that I worship. So I continue to be alert to look for examples of ways to include everyone and and to be included in in my experiences in different churches lastly um, i would encourage um, each of us as individuals to um, begin to build relationships in order to engage in this work um, none of us can do it alone, as um, I have encountered uh, the heart of community in my life as a, as a participant in faith. I have made it um, a goal to push myself to build relationships, not just with people I'm comfortable with, but with all kinds of different people. Um, and so that has meant being intentional about developing a support system. And at times that has um, meant uh, talking to a, a therapist or a pastor or a coach. Um, I um, have invited friends to uh, journey with me and to help me uh, grow in my own experiences in um, disability uh, justice and in um, dismantling ableism in the church. I can't know what other people experience until I get to know them and ask them. And so I'd encourage you to think about who, who you could ask or partner with to uh, develop your own accountability support system in your own journey. And for me, for a long time, it was there was books, not people, that I connected with. And so perhaps there are resources uh, in terms of um, books or um, videos or movies that you can begin with to um, uh, understand someone else's perspective and begin to build relationships around you. I believe that um, as, a, as a Christian, um, nothing that we do is done in isolation and ministry is not done in isolation. Um, so uh, in churches, I encourage um, uh, people not just to have prayer partners, but to have um, partners in, in uh, helping them uh, explore ways that God might be calling them into ministry. I remember in a, I worked in a Christian youth camp, and um, it was a camp for um, kids of all abilities and disabilities. It was um, designed uh, to encourage them to explore the outdoors, and it was a week-long camp. 
Um, many of the kids were away from home for the first time. And um, we encouraged them to choose their partner every day. And um, I remember one, um, one little boy in particular partnering with another little boy who was a little older than he was. And he used, um, uh, this younger boy used arm crutches to get around and they had a trust building exercise outdoors. And, and he was the one who initiated um, taking uh, risks and encouraging the others around him to try new things. And uh, his, their example of partnering and supporting each other um, uh, has just been a model for me when I'm looking to build relationships of equality and belonging in the church. On the screen is a scripture from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. It says, after these things, the Lord commissioned 72 others and sent them on ahead in pairs to every city and place he was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. So this encourages me that the results are going to be way more exciting and joyful and bigger than we can imagine when we're willing to partner with others and build relationships uh, in the church, we can um, begin to grow in ways that we can't imagine, but that God will bless. And I turn it over to Lynn. Okay, so now we're moving into four things that congregations can do. Obviously, individuals build into what congregations can do, and we're going to finish up. Melinda will come back, and this is Lynn speaking. Um, come back in and talk about things pastors can do. You know, so there's overlap, but some of you come as pastors, some of you come as congregational members, and these are things that are going to be kind of aiming particularly at you. So I'm going to start with doing an accessibility audit, and all of our denominations have different audits. Um, you've got a good one that's three different pages. The thing is with audits and accessibility, and I'm absolutely an accessibility not, I mean, I'm forever measuring, forever looking, but it isn't about measuring. It's about accessibility features. And if we don't have them, how does that impact a person? If we do have them, how does that empower and enable people? So what I'm challenging you to do as you're doing your audits is to do it through the lens of ableism. And in ableism, we're looking at assumptions, right? Who is this built for? Who is the world built for? So in terms of space, who is this space designed for and who is left out? And on the screen is an image of a very nice ramp leading up to a chancel area. And there are also steps that are nice contrasting colors and there's a good handrail next to them. So just kind of an example of a space that is anticipating some people are gonna need to use a ramp. Some people are gonna need to use a rail on the stairs or to see the edge of the stairs. And, yeah, you know, my ideal images, I couldn't find one quickly, would be one that the ramp is the way everybody goes up. Um, that's where we get into universal design. Um, but you know, when you think about assumptions that were made traditionally stairs to the pulpit and then even stairs up to the chancel, you know, who were they expecting that would be in those spaces? Um, you know, an immediate example would be, we kind of talked a bit about it already, an image on a screen where I have only images and music coming in. Who is that designed for? Is that designed for everyone or are people who can't read English, people who can't see the images, people who are busy taking care of the child on their lap, people that are distracted by what they just dropped and they're picking up, you know, who's being left out? And so as we go through each item on an accessibility audit, we need to be looking in terms of that. Um, and then we, this started a little bit yesterday and we wanted to spend some thinking time about um, unspoken expectations. That's another piece of, as we're auditing our spaces and ministries, how should people act in this space? And if people aren't acting the way we think they should act, um, is that our problem? Is that their problem? How do we access conflicting, how do we accommodate conflicting access needs? And Examples that were brought up in the questions would be someone who needs bright lights because they have low vision, 
and someone who is triggered by bright lights, especially bright fluorescent lights, or someone who tends to startle at loud noises and someone who doesn't have control of making loud noises. Um, you know, those things, as we plan inclusive worship and fellowship, those things are gonna happen. Um, unless we're in a bubble by ourselves, then we're not in worship, we're not in fellowship. So how do we deal with that? Um, part of it has to be um, coming up with ways to um, communicate in and develop relationships. Um, Linda was actually explaining a little bit more about this, but I'll try to explain what she was saying in terms of having the person who has difficulty controlling loud noises and the person that is startled get to know each other, develop a relationship, kind of learn cues from each other so that it's not a stranger making this loud noise and it's not unexpected. And so that in relationship, you're starting to meet each other's needs, you're starting to know each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and you understand, oh, that's that person, I can handle this. And maybe I've got noise canceling headphones on or something too, just to help. But it's about relationships and trusting each other, um, relationships with caregivers too, possibly a caregiver of someone who comes and has dementia and, and will speak out. And then another question was, how do we ask those who aren't present what kinds of accessibility they need? And I think a lot of that has to do with, we don't make assumptions, we communicate everything. We communicate it from the pulpit, we communicate it on our website, we communicate it on the bulletin that, um, Every, you can sit, you can stand, you can, you know, whatever variety, whatever diversity, all of that is absolutely okay. Another piece we talked about not wanting to do things alone. I know you have a tradition of having an advocate in every church. I hope every advocate has a team behind them because it's pretty hard to do any kind of change, particularly any systemic change within the context of one person and a church. So setting goals is fine, but you cannot, as one person, create the change that it's going to take and monitor the policies, monitor um, how, how things are done, looking at the website from different perspectives. Part of the, the beauty of having a team is that you do bring in the different perspectives and people who use technology and spaces differently. And bringing in um, a survey of some sort and always has Jenna pointed out making sure that the people who live with disabilities are the ones that are making the recommendations prior. They're at the center of the table in terms of the changes that are going to be made. Um, another thing that the, this team can do is make sure that information is present, not just information, but symbols, signs, you know, wheelchairs as you come in the door, um, assisted listening, systems as you come into the door of the sanctuary. Um, bulletin boards that show support groups that show disability awareness events and activities you're doing. And the image that is on the screen right now is a bulletin board that says, what if we were a church who practiced come as you are? And there's a lot of diverse, ethnically diverse, other kinds of diversity as well, but there's a prominent picture of a woman using um, a service dog and a little boy in a wheelchair. And as you're meeting with the team, I say this from total experience, close each session by identifying what concrete action steps you're gonna take and who's gonna take responsibility for them because otherwise your inclusivity team can become kind of a gripe session where again and again, you're talking about, okay, well, this is still a problem, this didn't happen. Um, so if we're gonna change the culture and system of the church, um, it's also then important to have people with disabilities in leadership roles. So not just at the table at this meeting, but in other leadership roles, other parts of the church. Um, and this also addressed the audience question, how do we offer robust accessibility? Really having visibility of accommodations everywhere from the website throughout the church. And then another, piece of this, this is kind of a, a different track. This isn't a committee, this would be starting a discussion group. And this certainly can be in an existing class or small group. So the first thing with whatever group that we're doing is making sure that that group is 
a fully accessible group. So in this day and age with COVID, we're talking about a hybrid group if you're having in church, also having online. And a lot of the things that we're talking about, I have additional hybrid handouts, like there's one on hybrid worship and, and events that I would be happy to share with you. But practicing accessibility exactly as we're doing it now with descriptions of anything visual, having captioning, having documents ahead of time, don't expect people to be able to see them on their screen. And one of the best ways, I think, some one of the question was, well, how can we practice what we're doing here, take what we're doing here and take it to our congregations in terms of describing things, describing ourselves. Just anticipate there's somebody on the phone. I'm glad you pointed that out today. There's somebody who's joining here on the phone who said, you all have been doing a really good job of making that person feel included because of giving the description. So just assume somebody is on the phone that will take care of the needs of somebody who isn't on the phone but can't see the screen. Um, and then you know, making sure people who are less tech savvy aren't left behind at the same time too. So I'm offering what I call the ableism toolkit as something that could be done over a series of weeks in a small group setting, because a number of you mentioned yesterday that some of this seems pretty overwhelming. Um, how do I reach out to someone who has a disability without being too nice to them? You know, what does that even mean to be too nice? So these tools are awareness tools, but also tools that give you some scripts, give you kind of a place to start with how you engage with people with various kinds of lived experience with disability. So it starts with a understanding ableism article and then the toolkit, there are links and you'll get the link at the end, although I think we'll end up putting these on the end ableism at church website eventually, but for now I'll, we'll give you the link. Um, so the able privilege is one of the documents that's linked what Melinda did was an adapted segment from that, but this is a two-page document that could easily take a week or two in your small group. And I'm going to go through the next some samples from the next two do's and don'ts of being a disability ally, which will give you a lot of tools to think about and ways to help examine how you interact. And the ableist microaggressions um, tool and worksheet, and then other things that are there. There's a list of resources. There's an ableism glossary. If these terms are new to you, you could spend a week talking about meanings of terms. And then there's a skit that's kind of fun to do. It was put together as I was developing the curriculum for our mission use study. And my advisor was a woman who had been blind for 10 years, sudden blindness. And she would tell me these stories about being at a restroom and somebody coming up all of a sudden as she's at the sink and grabbing her hands and putting them under the water as if she couldn't find the water when she'd already found the sink <laughs> or helping her in the restroom to find the stall a stall that was open and then all of a sudden they're saying oh and the toilet paper's right there and going, you didn't shut the door after you helped me so that can you believe it is for those of us who haven't had these experiences Somebody spitting in and then putting their hands on your eyes. Can you believe it? That's a new one for me. That that could fit in this skit really well. Come up with your own skit. Sometimes it helps to use humor and laugh because it's so sad. Otherwise, that you know the pain of it. I think when it gets, it can get to you and kind of almost paralyze you because it is so overwhelming. And I cannot imagine undergoing it day by day. But that's why I'm teaching you about it. If this is new to you. And if it isn't new to you, then this gives you some tools that you can give to your friends and family and say, read this and then we can talk about it. So of the 10 tips for the do's and don'ts of the disability alley, I picked two to go over just to kind of give you an idea what this toolkit is. Um, one of them, number one, important number one is listening. You've heard that already from other speakers, but I think it's worth repeating do listen and not just listen superficially, listen deeply to what's beneath this. And hearing the stories, the concerns, the hurts, and believing it. How many times people have said, I tell people, and they just totally dismiss, they rationalize, they make excuses, they get defensive. You don't have to say anything. They're not expecting you to say anything, but wow, or you know, with the spitting in your eyes story, shock. Um, your facial expression, if the person can see you, is enough. Spirit, acknowledging pain and injustice 
You're absolutely not quoting scripture, theology, truisms, any of that. Um, and the second one I just picked was the advocacy one. So a do is do advocate. Um, but at the same time, don't jump in to be the savior, as Jen, Jenna pointed out, too. So certainly we challenge unjust policies within our church. We don't assume somebody else is going to do it. If we see an injustice and it's a safe and appropriate time to speak up, we do it. If it's not a safe and appropriate time, it might come in later. If it's something that is being um, addressed to a person with a disability, and I'll get to that a little more in the micro aggressions, but whatever we're doing, always asking for feedback, following the lead of people with disabilities. So for instance, any of the documents that I write go out to our whole committee, which includes many people with lived experience, and I'm not going to publish anything until I've had that fee feedback. Um, and because you don't want to jump in not knowing the, the facts of the, of the situation. So one of the questions yesterday had to do with microaggressions. And I know some of you said ableism, this was a new term to you. And so I'm assuming privilege and microaggressions are also new in the context of ableism. You may have heard of them in the context of racism training. Um, they're the same words, but it looks a little different in each context. Um, one definition of microaggressions, it's just an, an insult or slight, a disrespectful comment to or about a marginalized person that could be deliberate. You know, I'm talking about full rude discrimination. This is something that sounds all right until you really listen a little more deeply and they go, wait a second, that was not okay. Um, so it could be innocent with good intentions, but uninformed, or it could be deliberate. Um, and often the person who is saying the thing says, well, that was just one thing. It's why, why are they making such a big deal of it? When you've been on the other end and receiving these again and again, you talk about daily ableism, it adds up. There is a traumatic cumulative effect of statements like that that cause you to feel it's not all right for you to be in this space. You don't belong. So um, the, of the studies that they have done on ableist microaggressions, um, these seven and the toolkit goes through all seven of them, the tools, but I, I'm only gonna highlight two of them, but um, it's talking about denial of your identity and your experience of your body touching you without permission of your space, of denial of information, forcing helplessness, um, and thinking you're there to inspire or benefit. Uh, you're the, the hero and so therefore you're being lifted up, um, making assumptions, it's called the spread effect where if someone has one impairment, maybe you can't see people make a point to talk really loud to you. Um, or assuming because you're blind that you have just supernatural hearing. Um, treating you as an infant, um, you know, certainly not as an adult, as a second class citizen. Those are categories of ableist microaggression. So uh, the handout is ableist microaggressions in the church and just some examples of denial of privacy of information, for instance, is asking for a Sunday school child's IEP school documents before the child can participate in Sunday school. If you're not requiring similar things for other children, sharing diagnoses information with um, anybody who doesn't need it and nobody needs it. They need to know what you need to participate. They don't need to know what's wrong. Um, so the same thing in a registration form, if you're asking about disabilities rather than accommodations and assuming that rules that we put in place for boundaries and safety protection for children apply just as well to adults with disabilities. And then the second one example of assumed or forced helplessness, um, people who use wheelchairs and, oh, it's only a couple steps, we'll just carry you up the steps, um, apparently happens more often than we would like to think. Or, you have potluck in an inaccessible space rather than moving the potluck. Oh, well, we'll just bring the food up to you and a couple of people will sit upstairs with you, it's okay. And um, not asking people with disabilities to serve as leaders, not even as thinking about asking people with disabilities to serve as leaders. And then taking away someone's mobility cane, walkers, crutches, and so that somebody needs to get up and go to the bathroom, they have to ask to have it brought to them that you've forced helplessness at that point. Um, another piece to looking at, um, now we're going back to this is the, the last thing I'm gonna go over 
of things that congregations can do is addressing sensory needs. Um, sensory needs, not just in the classroom for kids. A lot of us have sensory needs where lights are too much, sounds are too much, vibration is too much. You know, I, I am on that sensory reactive spectrum. So it's not, again, about labels or diagnosis, about who needs help to participate by having their sensory needs met and not by other people, quoting Melinda. Um, I, so one of my goals has to been has been to show how you can use sensory needs in a faith-based way. If you're going to create a sensory space, it should look like a church space. It shouldn't look like a therapy clinic. And so I have an image here that shows some things that can be available in every classroom and in every sanctuary. And I'm going to just kind of describe around the circle. There's a bottle that's been made that's a mixture of water and glue and glitter and pom-poms. And when you shake it, it's like rainfall coming down in the bottle. And it can be a very calming activity for any number of people. We're not just talking about autistic kids. We're talking about people with dementia. We're talking about people that are doing a keynote and they're, um, they're nervous, you know, ways to calm down. Um, and then the next thing to the left is a weighted lap pad that has, it's textured, it's about five pounds and it has a Noah's Ark theme because we put together a Noah's Ark sensory space. And then there's a rainbow, um, it's a couple of socks that is a weighted shoulder pad. For some people, weight helps ground them, helps them focus. And these are you know, ways that people with dementia might benefit. Um, any number of people, you look at how popular weighted blankets have become, um, a lot of people benefit from this proprioceptive weight to help calm them. Then there's a bottle of hand sanitizer to remind you that if we're doing this, we have to have ways to sanitize it. So one church has bags for each family that has the objects in them so they don't have to track them. They can just pick them up when they come and then they can do their own sanitizing. There's a number of ideas of fidgets and noise canceling headphones and a visor to keep the fluorescent light. Um, so one of the things that I think is worth thinking about is instead of having a sensory room, there's more and more sensory rooms being developed in churches. And it's a great idea if you have the staffing for it, but in terms of safe sanctuaries, you would need two extra unrelated adults to go with that individual to that room and still leaving two unrelated adults in the classroom. That's a lot of heavy staffing that most of us don't have. So instead of that, I had the idea that you should have a sensory corner. And it's, I mean, it's not an original idea. There's a lot of elementary school classrooms that have a sensory corner. It can be bigger than the one that I'm showing you is this fire retardant prom gossamer fabric that is inside of a hoop. And the hoop has little fairy lights on it. And as you close the hoop, the curtain around you, you can see out, but people really aren't seeing you. And you have this sense that you are in just kind of a calming space. We all sat in it and felt like it really did calm us. This was at a big um, workshop, a, a national event, and several people were really excited to see that. And they said, I'll be back if I need it. They were really happy to know that that was there. Um, one church that has implemented this is one that had tried to figure out why kids seem to do better in their school classrooms than Sunday school classrooms. So they actually went to the schools and saw these sensory corners and then they came back and implemented in the rooms where kids needed them. And then they realized, oh, these kids are gonna keep growing and moving to different classrooms. Why not just have one in every classroom and then one near the fellowship and sanctuary space too. And the second image is a person, it's the same one who's using the um, bottle in the first one. The second one, she has a weighted lap pad on and she's using a, a rainbow colored slinky. Multi-sensory worship is another way. Um, Way, making worship meaningful. These are both things from a, a worship that I did at a facility I was working at that I learned really quickly. I wanted to make sure that I was using plain language, but absolutely not dumbed down language. Um, using words that everyone can understand is actually a discipline. It's really easy to use big theological terms. It's harder to come up with terms that everybody understands, but just an example of this was the parable of the sower and I had a bin with some good soil, some soil on top of a brick, some um, thorns and some rocky soil and some seeds. And then the other activity was one where I had a, an, I made a number of paper doves 
And as we were playing music about spirit coming, talking, the story was about Jesus' baptism. For each one, we went around one at a time and um, kind of blessed them with the dove coming down over their head, including the caregivers who wanted it. And it was amazing how many caregivers wanted and then sent the dove home with them as a reminder that, that God is well pleased with each of us. And with that, I will turn it back over to Melinda. Thank you, Lynn. This is Melinda speaking again. So we're going to uh, close off my section of, of the presentation talking about four things that pastors can do or those in uh, worship leaders in leadership positions, but specifically since I've been a pastor for um, a few years, I, I wanted to address things that my fellow clergy uh, can do. The first thing is to... Um, uh, take the scriptures as true that each person in the congregation is a measure of the spirit and is gifted and graced by God for ministry. And so doing a spiritual gifts inventory and I, and having each person um, identify one or more of their spiritual gifts and then um, working with uh, those folks to include their gifts in the life of the church. One example of this was um, in one church I served, there was a, uh, a young woman with Down syndrome and um, she, she and her um, friend in the church um, did the spiritual inventory, spiritual gifts inventory together because she couldn't read. So they talked it through and identified that she was very outgoing and made friends easily and was and liked people and liked to help. And so um, she naturally one Sunday gravitated toward the folks who were assigned as greeters and um, wanted to help. So we modified the greeter training to include being spontaneous. And whenever um, she was in uh, in worship that Sunday, um, and if she wanted to, they uh, would incorporate her as a an official greeter, and um, she would uh, uh, welcome folks into the sanctuary and and uh, share one thing that she liked about the church with them. A second thing that um, that pastors can do um, is to uh, think through critically the worship service um, and and begin to um, look at every part of it from the music and the songs to how much quiet there is uh, to how you um, uh, uh, engage in worship, whether that's um, in reading and non-reading participation. Um, if you have folks who uh, uh, don't talk, or, or vocalize, but can engage in worship in other ways with moving their bodies or, or shaking instruments or um, uh, uh, other, other aspects and all aspects of the worship service can be um, shifted and, and modified to uh, include everyone in the experience. Uh, so one of the things that I had to learn as a pastor um, in, uh, was to... Uh, Learn to be spontaneous and trust that um, the person who was uh, wanted to share in worship could. I see in, in my practice as a pastor, um, uh, as a United Methodist pastor, it's sort of an unspoken rule that if it's not printed in the bulletin already, then it can't happen in the worship service, <laughs> right? That we like to have things predictable and presented and no surprises. And that I found was really an ableist assumption. It was quenching the spirit because I had this uh, same young woman. Um, she was a little younger than I was at the time. So my age at the time with Down syndrome. And we had a practice in the church of, of people scheduled to offer special music during the offering time. So different members of the congregation would practice and plan and I would know what that music was going to be and, you know, tailor it to fit the service. Well, one Sunday she 
came to me at the beginning, right at the beginning of the service and said that she had brought her harmonica and wanted to offer the music during the special music time. She had brought a song and she wanted to play. And um, I had to uh, check my own desire for control and schedule and and see the the opportunity in front of me to include and and celebrate her gifts. I had no idea what she was going to play, but I trusted her heart and God's heart. And uh, it was it was fabulous. She was um, uh, I learned from her that I didn't need to control everything and it didn't have to be in the bulletin for it to be um, uh, a way of worshiping God. And um, and after um, she uh, uh, offered that the first time, uh, I really began to see the church culture shift to where they were um, less anxious about uh, needing everything to be predictable and more open to spontaneous offerings. Um, another thing to do is to really engage in how you offer prayer or who gets to pray and who doesn't. Um, a lot of times I have experienced um, folks really anxious and, about praying out loud or praying in front of people. Um, and um, I have to think about the ways that we structured the prayer time to include folks um, who didn't talk or didn't read and encourage them to, uh, to recognize their own prayer ministry. So um, one, one church I served, there was um, a person um, uh, with disabilities who had shared with me and asked for prayer because their uncle had died recently and their father was in the hospital. And, um, and then a couple of Sundays later during the prayer time, um, another person had shared that they were grieving the loss of a loved one. And I felt prompted to ask the person who had shared with me in private um, to pray for the other person that they were going through a grieving experience. And, and I asked just because I knew that they had shared a similar loss and so that perhaps um, they would have a heart to pray for this person. Well, it turned out no one had ever asked them to pray in church before for someone else. They'd always been the recipient of prayer. And that opened them to begin to participate in more ways in, um, and take initiative and feel like they had some prayer gift. And they certainly did. Uh, I treasure the times that that person prayed for me and my ministry as well. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, I would encourage you if you're uh, in worship leadership or as a pastor to think about how you uh, celebrate the sacraments um, rather than having, uh, you know, for example, regular bread for communion at the front and then an option for gluten-free at the back for those who might need it to just make all your communion bread allergy friendly and gluten free. And that way, no one is unintentionally marginalized. That this is a, a way to shift your culture in how you do worship so that everyone is welcome. You can explain what the, what the ingredients of the elements are, um, encourage folks who can't take uh, uh, food or liquid by mouth to still engage in spiritual communion and um, invite them to serve the Eucharist um, and to take part in baptism. One way would be to, um, in the in the parts where, where we um, uh, offer and share our vows and commit to one another to speak uh, one phrase at a time and have everyone else repeat that phrase so that you're partnering and doing kind of a call and response way to celebrate the sacrament. Um, and then you can begin to look at all the other ways you engage in fellowship and ministry so that everyone is included. If your tradition has um, potlucks or love feasts or meals together, then um, 
make it standard that there are ingredient lists and um, folks are ready to uh, serve everyone, not just people who um, who uh, might need uh, extra assistance. You can offer um, both, you know, regular China and paper products for folks like me who who can't carry heavy things like regular plates and cups and need lightweight um, utensils and dinnerware so that I don't drop them. <laughs> So um, those are just some ways to think about how you do worship. And as pastors, you have a lot of, um, of uh, uh, opportunity and power to model uh, uh, belonging and inclusion. I think that's this, all I have to share. Okay, so this know. is Lynn. I'm going to go ahead and do the image description on that since I put these images in. This is something I developed a number of years ago, and we called it the Potluck Alert Program, but it's a series of laminated cards that can be sanitized on plastic clothespins, and there's like a um, an allergy one, there's a vegan you know, meat one, there's a number of things. I just, what this is just showing is a box that has the colored cards in it and one of them has it where you can actually put the recipe on and then the other two pictures just show them in use at a particular potluck. So as we close and I'm sorry that we went over we are so excited to share these ideas with you um, and thank you for being such patient listeners but just wanted to remind make some few reminders as you go back into your own spaces this is hard stuff it's hard etern internal work it's not going to happen over time we're not going to get it right every time we need to you know, do the self-examination, prayerfully figure out where to start one step at a time and know that the spirit is going to nudge us and that we can joyfully expect that God is going to show up. And as God shows up, we can expect some changes and maybe worship things will move at a slower pace, right? That's going to give us all chance to absorb the message better. Um, it might involve more movement or times that we're not moving, moments of quiet. Um, hopefully it's gonna involve all of our senses and be more spontaneous. And I think there's gonna be more moments of delight because of it. And with all of this, I believe we're gonna be giving us a little glimpse of heaven on earth. And that is absolutely in doing this work as um, out of love, it's sacred work that we're doing out of love for God and for our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's all about justice, it's all about hope and accomplishing the dreams that you know, God has set for us. And so I have a link to our main resources. There will be others that, that keep being added, but it's helpful to find the, our website is umcdmc.org and then under resources, there's a lot of things and information at umcdmc.org goes directly to me. And thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a delight to be part of this. Annalise Radcliffe is the coordinator for Next Generation Engagement for the Reformed Church in America, which means Erica Fleming and I have the joy of working alongside of Annalise. If you don't know this already, you will find her to be passionate about many things, but particularly intergenerational ministry. She believes that youth ministry is the work of the whole church, not just the youth pastor. She and her husband, Ron, are the planting pastors of City Chapel in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Welcome, Annalise. Thank you for moderating today's panel and welcome back from quarantine. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Um, hello, everyone. For those um, of you I do not know, it is nice to be with you this afternoon. Um, just a, a little visual description of myself. Um, I have long blonde hair. It's pulled back in a low ponytail today. I have blue eyes um, and a, a very wide, happy smile to see you and be with you all today. Um, I'm wearing a white collared button down and behind me is a dark blue wall with a window letting in some beautiful summer light. Um, 
I have the pleasure of being joined here today um, with some wonderful panelists. And so I would like to welcome them to this space as um, quickly as possible. So I'm joined by Dr. Judy Vanderwood, uh, Victoria White, Vinnie Adams, Dave Vanderwood, Lynn Swed Swedberg, Melinda Baber. And you guys, I botched your names. I guarantee it. I am not good at reading names. And every time I get to the Bible names, I skip them. So thank you already for your generous spirits for joining us. Dave, how do you say your last name? Yeah, it's Vanderwood. You were really close. Vanderwood. Oh. You Dutch spelling there, friend. Um, so Dave, we're actually going to start with you. Um, we are going to establish an order as we go around and introduce ourselves to, to the rest of everyone else here. So, Dave, if you would begin by just introducing yourself and um, share briefly what has been one experience of ableism that you would like to kind of offer to, to the group. So we'll go Dave, Vinny, Victoria, Judy, Lynn, and Melinda. And we'll kind of stay in that order throughout this whole panel. So Dave, Vinny, Victoria, Judy, Lynn, Melinda. Dave, why don't you take it, take it away? Introduce us to who you are and what has been your experience with ableism? Yeah, thanks, Annalise. So like she said, my name is Dave. I'm a white middle-aged male with short brown hair and wearing a dark blue shirt today. And I'm sitting here uh, at City Hope GR in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And um, I think uh, just off the cuff, one of the experiences with ableism, um, you know, in, in the building that we are in, even has been pretty incredible as a church. We, we say we're, uh, I'm, I'm the pastor for a, a new church here in Grand Rapids uh, called City Oak GR, and we say we're a church of all abilities. And the uh, building that we share here with another church was built out for um, to really to best meet universal design standards is what we could. And so there were a couple of things uh, early on that um, even in some of the best attempts to meet universal design standards, we had to go back to and say again, like, hey, this uh, really doesn't work great for that in this particular way. And so one of those just had to do even with uh, a, a stage area that was already low, which was great and pretty accessible, but not fully accessible, right? And so uh, what did it mean to not just create a ramp, but to think about uh, full accessibility in the main worship center beyond the stage as well. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you formally in the screen. Um, and thank you for sharing your story. Vinny. Hello, everyone. My name is Vinny Adams. Um, I'm a 34 year old white male with short brown hair, although. My hairstyle, it seems, changes from time to time. I am in my home in Managua, Nicaragua, and um, my wife has COVID, so that's why I'm home. And I'm wearing a comfortable limited edition T-shirts representing the five stages of disability attitudes. It says co-laborers. Um, there is a, a boring blue background behind me. Um, and uh, my family has, has been here in, in Nicaragua for a year, and I serve with a ministry called Tesoro Stadios. We offer holistic therapy and education to about 140 students with uh, developmental disabilities in Managua. Um, but I primarily serve with our church outreach ministry, so I get to kind of travel all around the country and um, offer trainings to churches to be more inclusive. And so a lot of the conversations that are happening yesterday and today, I could only wish that this country culturally and, and the church culture here was uh, a fraction of where things are in Canada and the U.S. Uh, we're way behind here. And so I have ableism stories that um, would also 
make your skin crawl. But um, one of my favorite, just because of the response to it, was a pastor that we met with who um, a new family uh, attended the church and, and had a family member with dwarfism. And there's a major stigma in this country that dwarfism is caused by witchcraft. And so um, many of the congregants uh, complained to the pastor that this man was allowed to even be in the building because of the evil spirits that were represented within, within him. And so the pastor's response was the following Sunday to bring in a guest pastor who had dwarfism. <laughs> and, uh, and I loved that. I loved hearing um, this, this pastor's response. It was pretty um, maybe aggressive. <laughs> um, but from his perspective, it was a way to kind of, um, I don't know, wean out <laughs> parts of the, you know, members of the church, maybe that, that didn't have the same gospel vision. Uh, that Jesus does. And so anyway, I, I really enjoyed meeting, meeting with that pastor and, and uh, appreciated his, his, his response to that uh, ableist, you know, stigma fills kind of way out there perspective of many of his congregants. Yeah, Vinny, thank you. Thank you for sharing um, both your story and also kind of the invitation. We're going to talk a little bit about getting started and that's definitely one way to get started toward um, dismantling mental models of ableism, for sure. Thank you. Victoria, would you be willing to share next? Yes, thank you. I'm Victoria. I am a nearly 40-year-old woman with long dishwater blonde hair and glasses, which those of you who are looking at me will probably see light reflecting off of them, so you can't see my blue eyes very well. I'm wearing a green shirt and a sort of multicolored cardigan, and I have my office behind me somewhat blurred just to help with the lighting. Um, as far as encounters with ableism, I see them in so many places because I work with churches all around the country and have done that for uh, about 10 years. Uh, aside from working in ministry and in within inclusive education in Christian schools, um, I've also encountered it personally and had those experiences of someone praying for me at a time and in a place uh, and in a situation where that was not invited and created a very awkward situation. So I identify with those scenarios as well. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be a part of this panel. There are, I would say, some really heavy hitters in this group, and I'm just humbled and honored to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, Victoria. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for sharing. Judy, are you willing to share next, please? I'm Judy Vanderwilt from Holland, Michigan, member of Hope Church. Um, I've been a parent of children who had special needs, uh, it became my vocation to work particularly with an early intervention on language acquisition and behaviors. And then I worked in college and university settings where I um, taught students who were preparing to become teachers. And I've spent a good 30 years working within various church contexts, um, advocating for in full inclusion and of all persons uh, within our faith communities. Um, in terms of uh, an example of ableism, I find it interesting. We were doing a re renovation on our church and one of the things that was not included was an elevator to our second floor where there are about six or eight classrooms. Um, and uh, interestingly, our children's worker had to carry a child uh, in a full body cast up and down the stairs for a whole year because that, that was um, how, and she was very a fa very faithful participant in the children in worship program that we have. Uh, we had also done a church um, uh, accessibility audit and had identified that as one of the needs. So at the congregational meeting, 
I was a person who spoke up and said, you know, if we have extra money and if we do this and this and if and if and if, the first thing that would be added to the um, plan for the uh, uh, improvements in our building would be the addition of the elevator. Fortunately, at the very next meeting that was congregation wide, it was announced that even without extra money, the elevator would be included. And so th that was um, kind of a wonderful moment. And uh, now no matter who needs to use those classrooms on the second floor, they are accessible. Judy, thank you. What a, what a wonderful story with a happy ending. Sometimes yeah. we have so happy endings. So thank you for yeah. sharing a happy story. I think we yeah. all feel a little encouraged. Thank you. Yeah. Lynn, are you willing to share next for us? Sure. Um, I've introduced myself already, so I'll just jump in. And I'm going to stick with ableism that I'm still struggling with within myself. And one of it is I'm a writer and I love big words. And when you're writing theological things, it's really easy to use big words. And so we struggle with, do we have two versions, one that is for the pastors and one is kind of for the average person who maybe is not even college educated, or do we try to come up with one version that meets everyone's needs? And there's a lot of, as I mentioned, there's a lot of things that are hard. And the other is, as we're doing document accessibility for screen readers, there's certain things like everything needs to be left justified on the left margin. And my art mind likes to center things. And I like to have it attractive visually because I think that makes a difference for people who are reading visually, not to just have everything look the same on the page. And so I still struggle with, you know, I'm told we shouldn't make separate documents. It should all be the same for everyone. And yet, again, with those competing access needs, I'm, I don't have answers. I'm still struggling with some of that. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks for sharing that. It's good to be in process too. I think it helps all of us find our way. Thank you. Melinda, are you willing to share for us next? Thank you. Um, uh, yes, I encounter um, ableism uh, in the pulpit all the time uh, in terms of what I call toxic theologies. Um, and that my work is to continue to examine my own sermons and my own assumptions. That's but um, often, you know, I sit and listen to someone else's sermon and their expectation, for example, of heaven being um, where there, there are no more uh, wheelchairs or no more uh, disability, um, different bodies and limitations like that. And I have an entirely different vision of heaven being a place where um, the diversity of God's creation is reflected and in a social model of understanding disability, it's often the environment that creates the barrier. And uh, I see myself uh, on the other side as an autistic soul celebrating and worshiping God in all the ways that um, autism uh, uh, empowers me to do that. And um, somehow heaven's going to be a place where all of us are celebrated. So that's an example, just one of... Um, the continuing work to take a good look at God's expectations and what theology is being presented. Melinda, thank you. I, I feel like that was a really great entry into our first question. Um, one of the first questions that was chatted into us is just a question of getting started and your invitation for us to not just familiarize ourselves with God's vision of what God is setting before us, but also the invitation to reflect on your own imagination of what that vision is to look like. Um, I love your kind of invitation to think about how do you picture heaven in in its fullness and, and where are some of the barriers to your thinking? And that invitation allows us to really think thoughtfully about um, how then we're projecting our our images of heaven on others so thank you i really i think that was a great way to get us started the question for us panel is um what does it look like 
to get started as a disability advocate. Um, there is a lot of information that was shared in the last two days. And um, if you were talking to someone who was feeling very overwhelmed about their first day as a disability advocate, what advice would you give them in getting started? What is kind of one small or first step that you would recommend? Um, and Dave, we're going to start in the order that we went in the panel. So I'm going to start with you, Dave, every time I ask a new question. Um, if you do not want to share or if you're kind of like, yeah, I feel like everything that's been said has, has, been, um, has been communicated, you can stay muted. Um, but I will always give kind of a second to see if you want to mute and I'll, I'll make sure to call on you before we move on to the next person. So Dave, would you like to share for us? Sure, thanks. So I think for me, uh, I would say that I, you know, what I keep learning and recognizing, I guess, over and over again is just to um, remember to talk to and treat uh, every individual the way that you expect to be treated uh, personally, the way that um, you, uh, again, understand uh, or even assume um, the uh, the level of intelligence uh, being higher and so on too that for me anyway that served me really well in uh, honoring and loving and being uh, ultimately an advocate really for each other that's worked back in my way too where people become my advocate because they understand that uh, that grace works both ways. And so I think I'll just leave it at that for now as an entry point. Uh, thanks, Dave. I really appreciate that. Vinny, what would you add or how would you kind of answer that question? I think there was a lot presented today that answers this question quite robustly. Um, and so I guess I would only make my own highlights. I love the encouragement to not be a lone ranger to not go solo in this endeavor, but to build a team and to make sure that that's a diverse team. Um, you know, we get, to, we get to coach churches down here all the time that are uh, just beginning. And so uh, I think my, my biggest thing is, what does God say? And what do people with disabilities say? And those ought to be the first voices we go to. Right. So before we even make our own suggestions and task lists and all of these things, what are we hearing first to inform all of those decisions? Um, and we need to hear from God. We need to hear correctly, especially in a culture where there's a lot of misunderstandings. And uh, Melinda just pointed that those are those are everywhere. Those are in the first world as well. Misunderstandings and, and um, toxic theology. Um, so we need to hear correctly what God says, um, and then we, we need to hear uh, from people with disabilities before we hear from our own thoughts. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, where I would begin. And the last thing I would say is I loved the point in the, in the session as well to say, end every meeting with at least one tangible thing. Don't end the meeting with 20 tangible things, and don't end the meeting with very vague um, kind of un, uh, undefined things, um, lest we uh, ar arrive at a, at a uh, dumping ground for all of our <laughs> frustrations, which can easily happen. Thank you. Victoria or Judy, do either of you, Victoria, you are kind of next on the list. Judy, you're on deck. Do either of you have anything to add? Go ahead, Victoria. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as director of church services at All Belong Center for Inclusive Education, we've learned a lot from students in inclusive education settings in Christian schools for decades. And it's always astounding to me how much each one of us still, like Vinny said, need to know what God says about each one of us 
and then to hear from people. And so just to be listeners, right? And and I I constantly lean on this idea that God has arranged the parts of the body just as he wanted them to be. He's placed each one of us in the body of Christ with our areas of strength as well as our areas of challenge. And, um, and so we as leaders need to be vulnerable and, and put ourselves in a position to say, I have areas of strength, but I also have areas of struggle. And that's true for each one of us. So to model that as leaders, I think is really important because that opens up a safe and a brave space for each person to know that we are welcome and belong with our strengths and our gifts to give to the, the congregation and the body, just as uh, Melinda and Lynn shared, but also that we each have areas of challenge where we will need someone else in the body to come alongside us in some way. And so just to know that that is a universal truth and that is scriptural, I think um, goes a long way in helping us all to start from the right perspective. Thank you so much, Victoria. Yeah, Judy. I liked the idea that has already been expressed about not doing it alone as an advocate and the need for um, forming and what we've done is an accessibility ministry, which involves many people from many walks of life. And um, as a con uh, because of that, everybody makes their contribution and we get a wider perspective of what the needs are as well as uh, things that we are doing well. And um, one of our pastors sits in on um, our ministry. And the, what was so great was one day she said, every decision she makes and every event that we hold at the church is now filtered through a lens that examines the accessibility for all persons. And I love that. And I think without a number of people in participation that probably would not have been accomplished. I love that. Thank you so much, Judy. Lynn, you unmuted, but you're ready to go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, that kind of reminds me in the accessibility class that I teach, by the end of the quarter, the students tell me they're running around with a mini checklist in their heads, you know, so that that's that lens too, that you can't unsee once you're seeing it. But I actually go a little different direction. Another piece of accessibility I do has to do with events like your conferences. And, you know, that I think that's something that a lot of you are involved in too. And one of the places I start echoing what you're saying, the how I do it is if there are people who are using wheelchairs or have visible disabilities present, I just make a point of sitting a meal with them. This is all pre-COVID, but sitting down and just getting to know them as individuals and then towards the end if it's appropriate, um, you know, not if it's not appropriate, but just so how is this venue working for you? Are, you know, where, how, how is the room? How is it, you know, any suggestions just real casually in the part of relationship building and, um, I, I find that to be a good good place to help, a good easy way as opposed to a formal survey to get started. That's a great, that's a really, really great piece of feedback, Lynn. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Melinda, what about for you? Nothing bad? Okay. Thank you. Excellent. You guys, thank you so much. Um, one of the other questions that we received um, it's a little bit lengthy, lengthy, so I'm going to read it. Um, for passionate disability advocates who find it difficult to compromise with others at church, how can we embrace compromise so that the smaller steps forward can be achieved when larger steps forward are currently out of reach? So another way to kind of phrase it is really just thinking about the small wins when we know that there's bigger wings on the horizon? How do we kind of navigate both of those? Is there anyone who might, who feels inclined to start first? Melinda, I'm inclined to start with you because you didn't, you were good with the first one. Sure, I think um, uh, recognizing that, that everyone is in a different place. And so what their win is might look small to you, but it can be huge for them. 
And I reminded of the scripture that says, despise not the day of small beginnings. Uh, that uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first movement toward that journey, the first decision, the first prayer, the first recognition. Um, and we never know um, how much God is doing behind the scenes and what we think is a small step or a small start or a small uh, uh, question or conversation. Um, so uh, there are lots of, lots of things in our tradition, in our scripture, um, mustard seeds, um, a, a two-word prayer, help me, um, all those ways that, uh, that God can do big things. Um, and so um, I think acknowledging that, yes, we have a lot of work to do, but celebrating how much we've already accomplished, how much we're, we are moving, how much we know that we didn't know before, looking back from where we started and where we are. All those ways of shifting our perspective can help with that sense of we're not doing enough, this isn't enough, or it's too overwhelming. Hope that helps. Thank you so much. Yeah, that is a beautiful articulation of it. I don't even know what to add. Thank you. It was beautiful. Who else? Who else would like to comment? Dave, we typically start with you, so I'm looking at you. Um, you know, I guess I'm still processing the question. Sometimes I need time for that myself, just with my thinking. So I'm going to just uh, mute for a couple minutes yet. That's fine. Does anyone have an immediate response? Feel free to unmute and I'll speak out your name if you do. I would just, yeah, I would just add to what Melinda has said that I think you just need to celebrate every step along the way, whether it's big or small. Yeah. Uh, now for me, the elevator was big in terms of cost, but on the other hand, there were a lot of other things that were going on that were much simpler and yet had significant impact for people's lives. And so I would just say, we celebrate everything that makes it better for um, our, our fellow faith walkers. The invitation to celebration is huge. Um, it also, I love how it invites story when you celebrate, because you have to share the story of what you're celebrating. So you're almost reaffirming um, the, 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 the win, which I love. So Judy, thank you for that invitation and a reminder to celebrate. I may be wrong about this. This is Victoria speaking. I just want to jump in and, and wonder for a moment if there's sort of a question behind this question. I'm wondering if they're thinking about how to continue to push for the bigger changes that that uh, are necessary when maybe all that's happening are the small things. So I completely agree and would reiterate that celebrate what has been happening and make a lot of noise about that because that tells the stories of how each step does move us forward. Um, but I think that that's part of what that team does, as Judy and Vinny have already kind of said, is hold the church accountable, that we are going to celebrate our small steps, but we're not going to stop there, right? And, and maybe in this question is a little bit of a fear that the church is going to sort of pat themselves on the back and say, yay, look what we did. See, we've done some anti-ableist things here. So good for us. What else is on the agenda and in the budget, right? And instead to say this has to continually be a place that we are thinking about and how and wondering how to improve and constantly pursuing it. And so that I think takes that team and that accountability and having your leadership invested in this. Great eye, great eye, Victoria. I totally, I, I see and hear the question behind the question. So thank you for elevating that. And also, thank you for your, your added. Judy, you unmuted. Was there something you wanted to say in response to what Victoria said? Um, yeah, I think so. I think one of the issues with ableism is the fact that um, it happens 
so uh, easily without thought because so much of our behavior is um, in a sense habitual and we think we're doing the right thing and maybe we're not doing the right thing. And I think it's okay to be very um, open about how hard overcoming ableism can be. And um, for instance, um, some things that I was thinking about, um, for instance, I've been an educator and as an educator, my goal is always to help everybody become all that God intends them to become. So I, I see myself as a, have seen myself as a facilitator of growth. However, we also say we want to accept people as they are. And in some ways, I think there's a tension there, a tension between, for me, between what I want to accomplish and what I don't need to worry about accomplishing. And so uh, that's one tension. I think there are other tensions uh, in the fact that all people don't want to be treated alike. Uh, some people are, are very um, forthwith with the knowledge about themselves, whereas other people say, that's my private business and I, I don't really care to share that with you. Um, there are other tensions when in fact we instead of going directly to the person who um, has the disability, we sidestep them and we talk to their spouse or we um, talk to somebody else on, uh, and assume to get answers on behalf of that person. And I think in many ways, as one person shared with me, he would rather be approached directly about how to, how to prepare communion for him when he has trouble grasping the cup or grasping a small piece of bread. Whereas if he, he had a bigger piece of bread, he could handle it. And I think we just can't make assumptions about how the best way is to um, be of uh, embracing of everyone as a co-laborer. Judy, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have two unmuted panelists as well, Dave and Lynn. I saw Dave first, but um, is that all right, Lynn? Okay, great. Dave, go ahead, and then Lynn will go to you next. So just listening and thinking here a little bit more, um, a, a, little, a short little story comes to mind. And something that we talk about here uh, with City Hope GR is just, again, this, this word grace and that uh, together we want to be gracious uh, and that we think about those impacted by disability first right with everyone else. Now, does that mean that we're going to get it all right? Absolutely not. Uh, but it means that we care that much. It means that much to us, that every person means that much. And, and so when there isn't something uh, that happens that would be helpful, we want to know about that. Does it mean that that will change the next week or that day? Maybe, maybe not, because it's also about what we can do in, in the time and with the resources we have, but we also recognize that we encourage and love each other and want to take steps together. So that comes back to this team again, uh, but always talking about grace and understanding the greater vision that we are all needed, we are all gifted, we are all made in God's image with a plan and a purpose. And then just a really brief, short little story. Uh, we have a family who uh, has, is part of City Oak GR, and they had just been, like many, really tired and, and um, sad, uh, just hurt 
in some past experiences and we're happy to have a place where they could be and be part of and belong where they also knew that it was okay to not have to jump in and do all kinds of things right away where they could be and be loved and find some healing and wait to see where it is that they also might have a heart nudging to be part of this together. So we do it together. And uh, one Sunday after the service, I went and spoke to the mom and I said, you know, I would love for there to be a, a, a way where the kids could uh, be part of what happens up front. So they help lead in some way, whether it's through part of a prayer a whole prayer, uh, helping with some announcements, doing something related to the message or with the worship team. And she, you could tell from her body language, got really um, tense and kind of nervous even and said, oh, but we would have to have that so planned out and it would we'd really have to know so far in advance and all that and i said we could do that we'll we'll do whatever we need to do okay so we'll see where it goes and after i said that you could just see her just relax and the tears come to her eyes and she said you mean it would be okay however it went and i said yes it will be okay, however it goes. Thank you. What a beautiful, it, it does a couple of things, right? It's back to that invitation of just getting started, right? Just approaching the family and, and creating a, a dialogue. Um, but it also is such a beautiful story, Dave. Thank you. Lynn, you are unmuted. Okay. What would you like to add? So I was kind of looking at that word compromise because we're looking at two people that have different ideas or two groups, two factions and thinking in a church, you know, we're not usually, we don't do well if we do everything by democracy and 65% wins and the other half don't matter. Everyone matters. And so it's more of a consensus model that is a helpful model when we're looking at potential conflict. And I think there's always the concept that if somebody it's their own idea they're more likely to go along with it. So I think that's where educating comes in. And so somebody that's opposing something maybe doesn't really understand what it's about. And so getting them involved in helping problem solve and coming up with something that in the long run might be, you know, the whole win-win for everyone. So I think just kind of looking at making sure that we're not pitting us against them in anything that we're doing that may not making it adversarial. Lynn, that's actually a very helpful invitation in stepping into our next question. Um, so thank you. Um, the next question is really, how do we make safe spaces for individuals to ask for accessible needs? There's another question that I'm going to combine with this one. It's also, it, maybe it, it's not even just an individual asking for needs, but it's it's asking people what kind of accessibility they might need. So twofold question. How do we create safe spaces for people who are looking and seeking and communicating that they have accessible needs? And then on the, the flip side, what's the best practice for asking what kind of accessibility people need? Are we going in order? Is Dave up first? Sorry, thank you, Victoria. Why don't we, with this question, it's a little bit hard. So if you're willing to go first, Victoria, that would be great. Uh, you unmuted, so you sure. unmuted yourself <laughs> to go first. And we will just, once you unmute, I'll call on you. So thank you, okay. great question. Sounds good, thank you. Um, I want to think about the, the second part first in terms of asking people what their accessibility needs are. And I think you all have modeled that really, really well and how you've put on this event. So I would just encourage people to look at how this happened and the questions that were asked. So I think about just registering to participate, you know, when you have that greeting packet or that first conversation with people 
ask some very simple questions that start with areas of gifting. How do you want to engage? What do you enjoy doing? So that you know what people love to do, what their areas of gifting might be and start the conversation in a positive way. And then ask the flip side of that. Are there any challenges that it would be helpful for us to know that you're willing to share so that we can make your experience here uh, one of flourishing and thriving. And you can word that however it's most comfortable, fits in with the rest of the language you use in your registration process or conversation. Um, and again, right, meeting people where they are. So if they're going to do better, if that's an online form that they can see before they show up, do it that way. If it's something that is going to be better received verbally in a conversation, um, do it that way. And so you have to start with being a good listener and doing that active listening by having even those questions available in multiple formats in different ways. But especially if you have any kind of registration form for what people are going to get involved in, just starting to ask those questions right on there um, in a very basic way is a good thing. And then I think that also starts to answer the second question in terms of how you provide a safe and a brave space that people can ask for things. Um, I, I think it goes a long way to start asking those questions before they do, right? Uh, of we're anticipating that you have needs that we might not have thought of, but also just showing that you have thought for some needs, that, that you have some elements of universal design in place just to show, and again, that celebrating those small steps that you've already taken. Be be verbal about it, be visual about it, show that you have people with varied abilities already in the congregation or that you're already doing things to create welcome spaces um, and, and, and online spaces and, and programs and services. So show what you're already doing and show what you're willing to do if people ask for it. One of the things that I find churches often get stuck on is that they think that they have to be able to provide everything right away. And, and I think it's very fair to say, we have these things in place all the time, but we want to offer these services if you need them, and it might take us a couple of weeks to get them in place. Um, and so that's already, like Dave has said, asking for grace on both sides. So those are a couple of thoughts, but I know you all have really great ideas to share too. So I wanna let my colleagues answer. Victoria, thank you. Judy, I'm gonna go to Vinny first. He had unmuted and then remuted. Um, Victoria, I also want to say, as a pastor um, in a church plant, that was such a great, I just felt like, I know what to do. I need to ask the question first. Um, that feels like such an easy, approachable first step to getting started, is even just being willing to ask the question, even if it's on a connect card or in some kind of capacity, what sort of accessibility do you need? That's that feels like a great, easy, approachable next step. Thank you. Vinny and then Judy. Go ahead, Vinny. Just a short thought. And I think I'll use the vernacular that this group is uh, familiar with, just using the word reformed. I think a, a helpful principle to use when we're trying to make changes or when we're trying to be more hospitable is I would encourage you to do less new things and more reforming of things that already exist. It's not so much that we need more initiatives, <laughs> right? We need to do better with what we already do. And so we don't need to complicate, for example, um, our getting to know new people in our church, because I believe every church has a way of doing that. And sometimes that's really intentional and official, and sometimes that's unintentional. And well, I, you know, we have conversations with people I guess what I'm saying is think about what you're already doing and do it better, <laughs> right? I think that's going to be a far more way of influencing the culture and kind of changing the culture of the church than just adding on this new thing where then everybody else is still doing the other thing uh, in an unaccessible way or in an unthoughtful way. So I don't know. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but I, so just to summarize that, spend more time reforming what maybe what the church is already doing. And because I think that validates people to say, okay, we're not, we're not doing this entirely different or new thing. We're just thinking about a better way to do what we're already doing and getting to know our congregants and meeting the needs of our congregation. Um, and then one other very small thing I didn't share in the last question. 
um, is that all of you as advocates are leaders and influencers. And there's always going to be leaders and influencers who get, who have moments of feeling unmotivated because things are going slowly. If you're a visionary, especially, and things are moving slowly, um, th these are just leadership principles, right? Of what are ways that you're going to stay motivated? Keep the big vision in front of you. Keep the, the big picture of, of what's on the horizon in front of you. Don't lose sight of it. I would encourage all of you uh, in that. And have other people um, remind you regularly <laughs> as you also count all the small wins and uh, celebrate those. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you very much. Judy, what would you add? Actually, what I was gonna say fits in, I think pretty well with what Vinny has just mentioned. And about five years ago, our church put together um, a booklet that tells all about the programs of the church. And we included within that booklet, uh, several pages that identified ways in which the church has worked toward uh, being ex as accessible as possible to its uh, participants. And um, so it has all kinds of things about a bus service and it has things about um, large print bulletins and equipment you can borrow from the church uh, if you need it, like wheelchairs and um, sit to stand models of equipment and so forth. And then when I went um, last week to our office to find out I needed a copy of it because I had misplaced one I had and the new person in the office was saying, well, I'm redoing it. And it was just wonderful because the additional thing she added was, um, she said, I'm a very visual person. And so in addition to the words, she's added all kinds of um, diagrams and uh, pictures. And I just think, wow, that's a, that's a new thing th that will make it very easy. For instance, we have cutouts in the, in the sanctuary where wheelchairs can go. And so now she has a floor plan that put, identifies where all the cutouts are in the sanctuary, where the ramps are to get into the chancel, where the ramps are to get into the sanctuary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful addition she's brought to this. And it just lays before people. Um, when they join the church or when once they start coming to the church, that kind of information is just right there for them. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, that's super helpful. Um, even just the reminder or the thought to have developing resources that are articulated in such a way, that's super helpful. Um, Melinda or Lynn, is, do either of you wanna to add to this question? No pressure to, I just wanna make the space. Uh, sure, I'll jump in. This is yeah. Melinda speaking. Um, two things come to mind. I think in in creating systemic changes so that our culture is one where um, people can ask for what they need um, is a uh, for me is about um, not just advertising that in in every area of the life of the church, but giving permissions from the pulpit, from leadership, and modeling that. Uh, that that um, uh, in terms of the kingdom's definition of justice, that everyone gets what they need and no one um, gets what they need at anyone else's expense, right? That we we are um, we need each other to get what we need so that we can flourish and thrive. So giving those expectations uh, every Sunday. Like establishing a culture requires repetition and normalizing it. So modeling it. And I would say a second piece to that um, is, um, is having a line item in your budget, a plan for financial um, uh, uh, appropriation uh, to make ministry changes happen. So um, in terms of my work with anti-racism, we have uh, a budget for reparations for for justice ministries, 
And the same could apply for your own local context in terms of accessibility and belonging and inclusion ministries. That it's, uh, we're anticipating that our needs change and that we're not there yet and we need each other. And so there's, there's that expectation that um, it's about, it's about asking for what you need and doing it together. Mm -hmm. Two really, really, really thoughtful and creative and challenging ideas, Melinda. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Lynn, you are unmuted. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. So you think about how people look for new churches nowadays and newer generations, primarily, they don't drive by, they don't come check you out. They start on the internet and your maybe your social media presence too. And so I think just taking a new look, you know, you've got all kinds of interesting things, maybe in a booklet, maybe somewhere but I, I don't know how many churches I've heard. They do wonderful things. And I go on their website and they try, okay, I look at home. There's nothing I look at new here. There's nothing I look at about us. There's nothing resources, you know, sooner or later, maybe I find something. So redundancy is important. I think have that information all over your website in all of those places. And maybe it can link to one primary page that lists all of those wonderful things that you're doing, but don't make people have to dig for it. And again, don't make them have to ask for the obvious. If you're always doing such and such every Sunday, if you always have an interpreter there and you don't have to ask for an interpreter, state that, then they don't have to ask. They know that that's available. So just really being upfront in your communications. Thanks, Lynn. That's super wise. It's a helpful reminder, too. Um, I think in all of what I've just heard, the, the number one thing seems to be just running an audit. And that was a, a question on here on where the accessibility audit um, can be found. I'm going to just voice that. That is a question that has been asked. Um, and I'm sure that Terry or Lindsay Wheeling Capel would be able to kind of share that as well. Um, you know, because we're on this conversation around resources, um, there is a question wondering about um, what resources are available to help with costs of improvements. Um, I'm just wondering if anyone on this panel might be able to share um, if you have kind of found or experienced or discovered some helpful resources. I do want to elevate again what Melinda just said, which is um, being prepared and kind of being proactive rather than reactive in your budget planning. Um, it's summer, which genuinely means that we're kind of getting ready or gearing up for um, new budget seasons. And so um, perhaps if you are writing your budget or in the midst of writing your budget, that might be something to consider. Um, but what resources are available to help with the cost of improvements? Um, maybe it's not a cost question. Maybe it's a, a different sort of resource that's necessary. But does anyone have anything that they found particularly helpful? And when you unmute, I'll call your name out and we'll, um, we'll hear from you. Oh, Judy and then Victoria. Lovely. Thank you. Um, I'm not real close to this, but my understanding is that within the Reformed Church in America, which I'm a part, um, there, there are funds through the denomination that can be borrowed for improvements within one's building. So I would just mention that. Um, our disability ministry, we now call it an accessibility ministry, um, also got involved with um, issues of justice within our community, in particular housing for persons with disabilities. And we started out thinking it would be all on our church to provide the funding for whatever thing we would do. And instead what it has just developed into a, a, a wonderful project with the Methodist church across the street from us. And we are now in the process of getting monies together to build 46 units, 11 of which are for persons with disabilities. And our church, our accessibility ministry is standing by to provide support to those persons. Uh, but 46 units, affordable housing, and there is um, federal financial support for doing that. And so um, 
it's it's launched. We started out as thinking we were looking for a house for four persons. And now instead, we've got this project. And it all started because of one young man in our congregation for whom this service is really critical. Judy, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And we celebrate with the work that um, Hope has been doing, uh, particularly in that young gentleman's life. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I do want to clarify two things about the RCA having funding. We do have funding. We don't have buckets of money. <laughs> I want to be very clear. But we have the Church Growth Fund, um, which is a kind of arm of the Reformed Church that allows you to apply for a loan if you do have um, resourcing needs that you have. It's a loan, so the expectation is that you pay it back. There is another grant called the Flourishing Churches Grant um, that allows congregations to make um, kind of a pitch for ways that they would like to improve their buildings. Um, and accessibility is now one of the kind of centralizing issues that, that the grant is looking at. Um, I'm sure Terry or Lindsay William Capel could provide some opportunity and access for that. Um, but Victoria, I don't want to move move past you, but I'd love to hear from you. You had unmuted. Would you be willing to share again? Sure. Again, just because I work with churches all across the country and, and am constantly being asked that question, I try to explore some options for people. And I know of a few. Um, there is something called pathways.org that does um, some small grants. They're usually about $1,000 a piece because one of their goals is to spread things far and wide and to force you to be creative with how you're going to use that. Um, so they have done some neat things and, and really love to tell stories of those victories of what did you do with $1,000 to improve the accessibility and inclusivity of your congregation. Uh, another one is Johnny and Friends. They also have some small grants. That grant cycle, I think, is a couple of times a year. Um, and again, fairly small grants. I think they're under $2,000. Um, so those are for some different projects. Um, I have another one I'm trying to think of. That's okay. Thank you, Victoria. That was very helpful. Oh, oh you got I it? know the other one. If you have yeah. bigger things and they relate directly to worship, I would highly encourage people to connect with the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. They are very excited about universal design for worship. And so if you can um, put together a grant and write one that has to do directly with worship practices and, and increasing um, everyone's engagement in that, then those can be a little bit larger and can be a great resource. Thanks, Victoria. Um, any other closing statements? We are at time, but I want to make space. Melinda, go ahead. And then Dave, I see you as well. Uh, well, I was going to uh, forgive the pun, add my two cents in, in terms of finding resources. <laughs> um, I have found that engaging with people who um, no longer attend, but used to attend my local churches and have relationships, um, however uh, distant, connecting with them and inviting them to share with me their vision for the church and giving them the opportunity to put their money where their heart is and to uh, uh, ask them what, if any, are the barriers of why you've stopped coming or why why you, um, you know, are, are less inclined to be, a, to be participating. What's happening here and how can, how can where's God leading you to, to share your gifts and resources and money to build a kingdom? Um, a lot of times where God's guiding you, God will provide, but we don't know how to ask for what we're passionate about and believe in and to trust that God has put that passion in other people's hearts. And that perhaps if you can if allow them to share what their heart is, is connected with, then they'll be willing to invest in it, literally and, and financially. So again, just some low hanging fruit, but look to build relationships with the people you already are connected with in your church, in your community, and engage with them, ask some, honest questions. What motivates you to give and where's your heart? Great invitation. Thank you, Melinda. Dave, what's your response or what resources do you know of? Yeah, so I think it, 
Thanks for that, Melinda, because kind of piggybacking that, um, I would say what I've found, um, unfortunately, on the flip side, as well as that a lot of the costs involved are much greater than what I initially had hoped or could even imagine. Uh, some of the accessibility um, products and, and resources out there are quite expensive. The good news is uh, that I think there are a lot of people that are waiting to be asked uh, to help, to be part of this change and are willing to step in to do what it takes, partly because they see the need, but they haven't been asked. And they also recognize they're asked for a lot of the same things, and this is different. And that's the sad part in a way, that this is different, that we're that early on as churches, I think, um, in recognizing and thinking about the importance of the changes that need to happen to be inclusive communities of belonging uh, that create equal opportunity, right, for people. But this is the beauty as well right now of being able to make those asks of many different types of people, and some of which, like Melinda pointed out, that are within our churches or within our circles, but some that are on the sidelines, some that have distanced, some that may have been hurt or whatever that we don't even know of, but each one of us, right, are impacted by disability within our families somewhere, within our friendship circles, within our work circles, and so on. And so the net is uh, can be cast pretty wide and we might be surprised. And in fact, I would say I'm sure we will be surprised by who uh, is waiting to respond. Great words, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is one question from the audience. So I'm wondering if, Ellie, you would be willing to unmute and ask your question. Um, we'd love to hear from you. No, it's not a question. I just wanted to um, uh, mention that another source of funding uh, could be your local uh, government, uh, like your provincial or state uh, or federal government. Uh, most uh, governments do have funding for uh, resources and uh, by all means make use of them. And um, yeah, uh, it, that could go a long way to, to helping to find money for what, what you, needs to be done. Excellent, excellent, Ellie, thank you. We really appreciate that. That's a great reminder also. Um, so we're gonna um, kind of transition a little bit, unless there are more questions. I do, I do wanna make space. If there's anyone that has a question, um, who's kind of been listening in. We'd love to hear from you. I'm going to mute myself so I don't keep talking while I'm waiting. At least you're amazing. This is Kara uh, Milne again. I just wanted to encourage, um, I love so much of this conversation. And also though, and not just, but also a reminder that some things are not about the money. That attitudes of ableism, that being a place that sees and welcomes people as they are, as they enter is also just as important. So uh, I think it's recognizing both because once I have a relationship with somebody or I see and care about them, then in turn recognizing that Victoria needs this or Vinny needs that comes so much more naturally second. So just recognizing that initial, I couldn't help but say something, but just that initial relationship is actually sometimes the thing that we need to start with um, rather than the secondary physical, uh, although they can be tagged. Thanks, Kara. Great reminder. Thank you. Anything else? Does anyone else want to speak into this space? Or... Gail, I think you have a quick thought or a question. Uh, not a question. I um, wanted to offer the information that um, I'm part of the Faith Inclusion Network of Hampton Roads, which is becoming national. Um, with the, our Part will become a chapter of the national organization. Um, and what we do is basically to provide some organizational assistance to churches, not necessarily in our area, but any 
one who's interested in needing some advice and an assistance to figure out what they, you know, how they can approach things. And we, that, so it, the, it, it, the resource is all one word, faithinclusionnetwork.org. And we're open for anybody who needs our assistance. Gail, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. A powerful resource is this network also. This is just a really wonderful space to expand and grow and evidently find resources we learned today. Judy, you unmuted. Was there something you wanted to add? Uh, I wanted to get back to the housing uh, issue. And I know that maybe for many churches, that's not part of their um, objective. But the organization out of Grand Rapids called Dwelling Place has been wonderful for us to work with. And um, they, they've they been at it for 30, 40 years and have done a lot of work in terms of addressing needs for both low income. And we have added to their protocol, the housing for persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, we already have a large list of people waiting in line for the um, disability units, assuming and hopeful that this project goes forward. Thanks, Judy. We definitely will be keeping the project in our prayers. I really am excited for you guys. Ellie, you're raising your hand. Was there something you would like to add? Yeah, in terms of uh, those people who were frustrated about the lack of progress in terms of uh, you know, uh, um, facilities for those with disabilities. Um, about 15 years ago, our church decided to do, add a significant uh, addition onto our church. And uh, I, as the church advocate, I offered to be on the building committee. And that proved to be really useful so that you know, in everything that we planned, you know, we could keep in mind persons with disabilities and their access to it. And um, we now have uh, a church building that is totally um, uh, accessible, except for the, the, the pulpit area, <laughs> which um, I'm going to be working on. Um, the, you know, basically the sanctuary wasn't touched. It was the whole addition and how you got into the sanctuary where the focus was with the building. Uh, but um, you, as an advocate, you can have a significant say in what what is, you know, what your building is going to look like and how accessible it, it would be if you volunteer yourself for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm. Ellie, thank you. Yeah, that's a good reminder, too, that your role as an advocate can be expansive in many ways, including um, serving kind of as an advisory role, too. That's really helpful. Um, all of you, thank you so much. Can we just say a big hearty thank you to all of our panelists in whatever way it feels the most appropriate to you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, just a reminder, um, this is just kind of how I was feeling called to close us. I was on this call last year with Zoe Sheets, and one of her invitations was, um, you're not going to do it perfect. You're not going to do advocacy work perfect. Um, if your sense of urgency is high, that is the invitation. Um, and also just to get started and not to be afraid to fail. Um, failure is not fatal in this in this arena, but trying is, is really um, important. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this. Um, I am just going to share you a little bit about a couple things. So ways to be involved. I know that um, Ellie was already talking about the ways that she was involved in her church. As a volunteer advocate, we would love um, any of you to start um, joining us. And so this is, I'll just read it. It's bit.ly um, slash uppercase DA, lowercase job, 
uppercase D for description. Um, it is case sensitive, but that's a way to link to our volunteers if you want to join us. Um, and then also, we would also um, encourage donations as well. Um, so there's if you are reaching out to the CRC for donations, um, it is crcna.org slash donate. And for RCA, it's rca.org slash give. So this is the website that we have been working on. I know, I know that many of you have been able to access it um, through our event. And we are going to just show you how, if you go to the top on the right, it says resources. And if we click on that page, we wanted to show you all the follow-up pieces to this event. Um, so we have um, Disability Awareness Week is coming up in October. Um, in the RCA, we celebrate it on October 9th and on October 16th for CRC churches. And we've created a bulletin um, insert that you can use that really talks about um, ending ableism within your church. So we would encourage you to access that. We also have a blog that we're putting together that will have a lot more information in terms of sermon prompts and um, litanies, laments that you can use. And we really encourage you to take space um, for that for the Sunday and for the week for Disability Awareness Week. And as well, we have had a lot of resources that have come out of both our speakers, um, our keynote speakers over the past two days and we've just started to compile it all in a resource folder so it's brand new we're just putting it together right now we'll continue to build it over the next couple of weeks so because um, we have had a lot of people ask for um, can I get this and can I get this absolutely we've reached out to the people and we have started to compile that for you so you will be able to come back and uh, access everything um, and we also wanted to announce, uh, we've mentioned this a couple times, we are having a book club. This is our, going to be our book of the year. Is It is um, Amy Kenny. Uh, My Body is Not a Prayer Request. I know that um, it's her name has been mentioned a few times over this event. Um, so we are going to have a lot of different ways that you can participate in this event, whether it's hosting it for yourself at the church or coming alongside us as we have a book club. We will be giving out a lot more information about that very soon. We did want to let you know that um, for this book club, we are we did we do have a number of free copies that will be available. We will be putting up a um, a Google form very soon, so just hop back here and uh, and fill out the form, and it is available um, to to our churches. So also. If you're interested to find out a bit more about this book, My Body is Not a Prayer Request, watch this trailer. It's a wonderful trailer where Amy shares a bit more about her book. It's short and sweet, and you will hear more about the book that we are really excited to share with you. Um, we also want to hear from you. So if you have stories that this whole event has really um, made you think about situations in your life that you would like to share with us, we would love to hear about it. Um, and again, so you can either write us at disability at crcna.org or disability at rca.org. In either space, we would love to hear from you. Also, um, hashtag, if you are big on social media, use our hashtag ableism at church um, and tag us as well. Um, fine, two more things, and then I will turn it over back to Terry. Um, we, if you're not connected to us yet, or if you're only connected in a couple ways, um, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter so we can keep you connected. That will also be where we'll share a lot about the upcoming book clubs. Um, and when this event is ready, we, as I mentioned, we have a YouTube page, a YouTube site. So make sure to follow us, subscribe to us there. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and you can follow us on Instagram. And finally, um, today, um, some of, this is some more information from some of our speakers today. They just, this is a great website um, that you can access as well for a lot of the information they're sharing with us. So please um, feel free to access that as well. So again, this is all part of the resource that we've put together on our website. Everything's there. We will continue to build it over the next few days as we get more pieces um, that have come through from this conference. So thank you. And I'm going to turn it back to Terry. Yes. Uh, so just want to say that this event um, and its resources and other 
all the great content will live on. And thank you, Becky, for reviewing some ways that that will happen. Uh, we also hope to develop this into some kind of uh, the content into some sort of a adult education or small group format. So watch for that as well. And maybe you would like to, as one way to introduce the topic of ableism or help to overcome ableism at your church uh, would be to lead um, a small group session or talk to your education folks at your church who plan the program programming to offer to do something like this. Um, we would love to have you think about what happens next as a result of this training. So Becky has just offered some suggestions to you as some possible next steps. Uh, you may help to uh, promote Disability Awareness Sunday in your church, whether that happens in October on those two Sundays or any other time. There will be lots of great resources for you to incorporate. Um, you may organize a book club at your church uh, using Amy Kenny's book. And whether it's to plug into an existing group, to organize a book group, uh, to join the one that we will be doing virtually, all of those are options. And the free books that Becky mentioned, we too are in need of resources. So there was discussion about what resources are available. Uh, we're not in a place to give a book away to everyone who wants one, but we will give one to anyone who agrees to lead a group at your church or in some other small group context. Uh, if you're willing to do that, we will send you a book. We'd love to have you do that in, in whatever way works for you. Um, We'd love to have you write about your experience of ableism, whether it's for our Breaking Barriers newsletter or a Disability Concerns blog on the network. Uh, we would love to hear your stories, painful, uh, whatever they are. Um, we really want to be in touch with you. So whatever you decide is a next step for you uh, as a result of what you've learned at this in the, during these two days, we'd be delighted to hear what you're planning to do. And you can send us an email at one of our um, two basic uh, kind of general email addresses, whether that's disability at crcna.org or disability at rca.org. So thank you for um, not just leaving this and saying, oh, that was interesting, but also prayerfully considering what happens next. Advocacy, including disability advocacy, is not for the faint hearted. It requires courage. Uh, courage requires vulnerability. As Brene Brown is fond of reminding us, vulnerability is the path to clarity, to spiritual depth to transformation. Disability advocates, I'm sorry to say, will never win a popularity contest, but we can be the agents of change who God uses in the holy work of transformed living. We've been witnesses these two days to the kind of vulnerability that this holy calling demands. And so thank you for hearing this invitation to be God's change agent, wherever you are. Um, we are here to support you, uh, to encourage you just as you are doing for us. So please stay in touch with us, with your needs, with your stories, with your joys, your frustrations, uh, your hopes and your dreams. I wanna, conclude just by reading an excerpt from Amy Kenny's book. This is really a wonderful book. I do hope whether you read a, uh, lead a group or not that you'll get the book. But the last uh, two sections are what she calls a benecryption, not a benediction, but a benecryption, one for non-disabled people and one for disabled people. Here's what she writes as part of her benecryption for disabled people. I am in solidarity with you, and together we hope against hope that we can create the inclusive church that we have never fully experienced. 
I pray that you follow Paul in boasting of your disability and learn the insights it gives you into God and incarnation and embodiment. I hope that you practice the trust of Moses to know that God is with your mouth, regardless of whether it speaks, and that God extends divine accommodations to you as God did through Aaron. I hope you summon the courage of Jesus to display your redeeming scars to this world, knowing they reveal God's glory to us all, even the disability doubters and the prayerful perpetrators. May you have a deep sense of your worth and value, even when those around you question it. Thanks, friends. This has been an honor and a privilege, and we've been delighted to share these two days with you. So thank you for sharing them with us. The Lord be with you.